yeah, so I hope that this topic is of your interest. I know it's a very somehow tight topic, the, this one of navigation, especially when it comes to Genesis. But hopefully when introducing also some mathematical estimation problems like the manifolds and the use of robust statistics, maybe this is of, of a general interest for your, for your lab. Um, so the idea uh, before anything else is to <laughs> Prior to everything else, I would like to acknowledge um, that this is not my, my only work, uh, but this is somehow a combined work across different institutions. In fact, there is uh, someone from Central Subelec, uh, Porsche has used to be in Subaero. Um, he's now uh, with you, but in the site of Lens. Um, and of course, we uh, our team at DLR is quite large, especially the one for multi-sensor systems, which is my team. And also we have some uh, collaboration with the uh, Northeastern University in, in Boston. And all in all, has created a, a environment or a microsystem we are, where we are actually quite motivated and trying to move or pave the, the, pave the road towards this type of high precision and, and robust navigation. And what does this consist of? Um, so we are aware that nowadays there's a lot of different intelligent transportation systems, this uh, terms of autonomous vessels, autonomous cars, everything wants to be autonomous. And for, or of course, also robots, for all of these systems who have certain type of autonomy, it is fundamental that they know where they are in a global frame, so to say, or in a national manner. Uh, what is their orientation, <clears throat> and, and of course, what's the timing. So um, global navigation satellite systems, this is whenever I'm talking about Genesis, that's what I refer to. Uh, maybe you know GPS, uh, that's, that's the American Genesis, and Genesis, what to say, is the general concept. Here in Europe, we have, in particular, Galileo. So whenever we want to navigate with these different constellations of satellites, um, what happens is that throughout their um, pass through the atmosphere, they get delayed, and then here on Earth, they have the signals gets reflected on diffracted on different metallic surfaces or some other surfaces, and this makes tracking the signals much more complicated. Not only that, but typically the, we will distinguish between two type of observations. I will talk about them uh, in a few minutes, and what we have conventionally, this is what we use. Uh, code base navigation, and this is something that it's in all of our smartphones uh, and in most of commercial low cost receivers. Uh, the, the accuracy for this is in a way limited. So we typically have one to two met meters positioning. And also, if we pull up our Google map, we will see that from time to time we jump from one side of the road to the other, even though this includes some information which is not only Genesis. And this, of course, due to multipath on some other local effects. Uh, and this really strongly degrade the estimator's performance. So the challenge, more or less, that what we want to cover from a broad perspective is that we want to use carrier phase observations. And these are the ones to grant this type of precise, or, or at least the, the high precision. And we want our overall estimation uh, process to be robust against these different outliers or unmodeled errors. Um, so, of course, more or less, I'm going to bring up three different research questions, but this more or less combining the same. Uh, the first one is that, of course, what I mentioned before, we want to have certain protection in our estimation procedures against outliers, out of distribution and unknown noises. And the way to to, to get this is via, via using robust statistical base filtering. The, the second topic is, as any other estimation problem, typically we have a certain type of parameters and certain, uh, let, let's say, yeah, at the end, parameters which are tuned or that are up to us to introduce in our estimation process. And if these parameters, we have certain distribution uh, on them, but this distribution is completely wrong, then it's quite complicated to get to an optimal solution. And what we also want to gain is this kind of resilience against misspecified parameters. 
and we want to apply these two estimation frameworks to an actual application, which is what I mentioned before. We want to have positioning and attitude um, for different vehicle systems. So we are going to put at the end nonlinear robust filterings or manifold structures. Um, more or less, the, the, the outline for, the, for this talk is going to be, first, I'm going to introduce the basics of how this precise navigation looks like. This might be the most boring for you, um, but maybe it's in a, in a way, it's, it's the introduction to the topic. And then I will talk about robust filtering, constraint filtering, and at the end, how all of this uh, mesh up together in some conclusions. So when we talk about precise navigation and when we talk about satellite-based navigation, how does this work? Most likely you are at least aware of this, but in case not. Um, so typically what happens is that we have all different satellites spinning around us. In the case of Genesis uh, satellites, they spin at 20, 20,000 kilometers from the surface of the Earth. And they send an image uh, and, and they um, send signals which are received on Earth. Um, of course, they are with a much lower uh, power. Um, they are attenuated. They are uh, shifted to the, the Doppler shift. And at the end, what we received on our receiver, it's a signal which is delayed delayed here again, which is affected by, by the Doppler shift. And of course, the signal is modulated with a carrier, and we want to track the carrier and the time delay in order to be able to do some ranging observations. So if we think of this from the time continued perspective, uh, the first thing our receiver needs to do is, of course, to, to take it into the digital domain, uh, typically with some intermediate frequency sampling. And we can only function whenever we estimate the actual signal parameters. And this consists of the amplitude of the signal, uh, the power of the signals, or typically you estimate the signal to noise ratio, um, the time delay, uh, the, the, the where are you within the carrier of the signal, and the frequency shift. When all of this is uh, managed, and this is exactly what our receiver needs to do very fast, um, we are we end up with something which are the code observations, which are derived from this apparent time of flight, and the carrier phase observations, which are derived from knowing exactly where you are within this carrier modulated carrier signal. Uh, as we will see later, carrier phase observations they are quite interesting because they are super precise, but they come at the cost that they always have a fractional part, so a real part of where you are within this range and some integer parts because you really know, you do not know how many cycles actually went through your receiver from the moment that you received the signal from the moment that you decoded it. So this is what we work on typically on the navigation field. Uh, we work on the ranging uh, level. And here, what I mentioned, we have the code and the phase and basically this is the observation, and our model is quite simple. We have the Euclidean distance to the satellites, some ionospheric and tropospheric effect. These are all due to the uh, propagation of the signal through the atmosphere. And then, of course, because we, we will never have perfect clocks, although we would like to, but we have some um, time issues due to, the, to the, the receiver, to your own receiver, and also to the clock offset of the satellite, plus some noise. The carrier phase observations look exactly the same. And the only thing is that now there is some uh, number here that appears. This is the wave, the wavelength times n, and n is the number of ambiguities. So, and this needs to be an integer number. Uh, by introducing this, uh, of course, we will have a more complicated system analysis or system, system estimation, but this comes with a much lower variance of the observations. So how does it look like? Um, let's think for a moment that we have three satellites around, and we have a big, vague idea that we are in this gray area. And we also know that um, if we receive signals from the satellites, 
that you could be in each of these bits of the signals or ambiguities of the signals. And of course, with one, uh, we wouldn't be able to know where we are. The moment we had three, we would be able to say, OK, this is the most likely spot where I am. And then I combine my initial hypothesis of where I am plus this um, integer estimation to know precisely where you are. Of course, whenever there is some noise, and this is only noise from, uh, let's say, the blue satellite, then you could say, OK, maybe now the most likely place where um, we are minimizing the sum of the residuals for the observations is this one, and this leads to a bias estimation. Um, so in terms of how do we solve this, um, what we are going to think is we have a particular estimation problem. Um, we think about the complete navigation of a vehicle, which looks something like the one on the right. So we have here a car, but this could be a ship or it could be uh, an airplane, and we have multiple antennas on it. And we also have a nearby base station. Uh, this is not relevant for you, but this is part of getting this high precision. And we receive data from multiple satellites. The complete navigation typically comprises the orientation of the, of the vehicle, uh, unfortunately, the ambiguities, the integer ambiguities, the position, the velocity. And in some cases, when you have uh, this type of inertia measurement unit, you also need to estimate the biases. The issue here is that we can say that all of these different unknowns, they live in a tricky space. It's tricky because uh, we have different things happening in parallel. On the one hand, for the orientation, typically uh, depicting this, this orientation leads to, uh, to a manifold. This is the particular um, unit sphere, three-dimensional unit sphere. This is the S3, which have, <laughs> funnily enough collides with the name of your seminar. Um, then you have um, for each of the ambiguity, so for each of the satellites, you have an ambiguity, and all of this needs to be an integer number. And then typically all the rest are just real numbers. So this combination, it's, uh, it, it leads to a complicated estimation process. We will talk a little bit later on about the manifolds, but if we first consider the general case where we need to deal with um, a vectors of integers and real, and real unknowns, this is what we call in, in the Genesis world the mixed um, estimation problem. Um, if we forget for a moment about everything we saw before, we have a very simplistic case in which we have some observations. Uh, we have A and B as unknowns with this as a linear system, and we have the different um, system matrices, and we have a given covariance. Since there is not an explicit solution that solves uh, simultaneously for integer and real, and real unknowns. Instead, what we would do is to say, OK, we are going to disregard the integer nature of the ambiguities. Let's treat that both A and B, so the ambiguities and the opposition, for example, as real numbers. From this, we construct what we call the float solution. And this is a solution that has not yet high precision. And then you try to, to find uh, via integer estimation the best so a, a mapping between your your real numbers uh, this hat a and the integer numbers which is just a and this is indeed the most challenging process of all um, and then if so we are always able to find of course an integer solution but only if we find the correct one and that's, of course, uh, impossible to know in a real system, then we can build our what we call fixed solution, which is improving our positioning solution by virtue of this um, integer estimation. Um, one of the things that uh, we figured out, and this was one of the contributions from my thesis and also the, the collaboration between Subaero, Central Subalek, and, and myself, was getting to know whether there exist efficient estimators, and if so, what is the best achievable performance? Um, yeah, you, you can check the paper if you want, uh, but I would try not to not to fit this in, into this talk. 
And a bit further words into this integer estimation procedure, this is a challenging topic. You may think that you have an N hyperdimensional episodial search. Um, so the, the dimension is given by the number of, of uh, ambiguities, which is indeed by the number of satellites. And you need to realize this mapping between real to integer um, numbers. And this is extremely challenging. Um, this is related to lattice reduction, uh, but overall we, we call this uh, integer estimation. And once again, this is challenging, but whenever we have this type of three-step decomposition, we can always focus on the float estimation and everything else more or less can be just focusing on what happens at the ambiguity level. Now, with this being said, um, even though the previous, the, 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 even the normal case is challenging, now we want to know what happens whenever we have outliers or unknown noises. So um, coming back to the generic manifolds we had before, as I mentioned, we can focus on the float solution. So initially we would disregard the integer nature of the ambiguities. So at the end, we just have the quaternion manifold. So the unit sphere, three-dimensional sphere, and real numbers. And from a filtering perspective, we typically have uh, the prediction, which is basically your assumption on how is the time evolution of the system. And whenever you receive some observations, you are trying to relate the observations with the observation model, given both your uh, covariance of your estimates, so more or less the prior on your state, and the covariance matrix of, of the observations per se. Um, as I mentioned, this is challenging, just also um, due to the presence of this manifold. Um, so what we do in practice is we work always in the tangent spaces, so we always somehow break down our unknown state into the nominal state and some error vector, and this error vector is always in the tangent space. And this looks something like this. I'm sure that you have seen this multiple times from uh, from Florent, but uh, I see here from Alexander as well. Uh, from most of you, in, in your case, typically it's for constructing a covariance, which also have these different uh, manifold constraints. In our case, it means that the quaternion needs to be always in this unit sphere in order to, to create a proper rotation. So if you are, let's say, initially here, and you need to update this based on, on some new observations, so you work in the tangent space in the algebra. And from this, you can work usually just with real numbers. And then you go from, you have this exponential mapping, which in our case looks like this. It's uh, always this, this uh, triad, which is quite convenient of the Euclidean, the algebra, and the manifold relationships. Um, and now the issue, what I mentioned before, if, if now we have um, not a nominal case with uh, known distributions of uh, Gaussian distributions, um, instead for robust statistics, the framework for robust statistics, they provide certain flexibility. The idea behind robust statistics, and this is somehow an old framework, relatively old framework, this was born around the 1960s, and the motivation was that the Gaussian assumption does not always hold. And whenever we do not have a Gaussian assumption, conventional maximum likelihood estimators or maximum a posteriori estimators with very rigid uh, assumptions, um, they can suffer from a completely unbounded, uh, unboundedly large biases. So what statistics provide certain flexibility. They would say, OK, a fraction, so if this is the complete distribution of your observations, a fraction of the observations is a Gaussian noise, and you do not know which fraction is it. And the remaining one uh, is a for completely unknown distribution. And you try to find new estimators which are nearly optimal whenever the Gaussian assumption actually holds, and but also nearly optimal whenever this um, this type of mix contaminated model appears. How do, you do, how do we do this? 
Um, so you would see that now the filtering and the robust statistics look almost the same. And the exception is that now the covariance matrix for the observations is not just a uh, big, um, this is what, epsilon? Well, I'm confused now with the Greek numbers. Um, but instead, it's something that may change. So you have your original covariance matrix and you are decomposing it and weighting in it. So you would say, okay, how good does the observations fit to the underlying model? And how good do they fit also to their um, prior on their covariance matrix? So what we do is that we look at the, let's say, normalized residuals and those observations which have a very low residual, typically they would follow the conventional um, so they would follow, let's say, for, for example, in this case, a normal distribution. Observations with very large uh, residual, uh, something like here, these are basically you are in details of the distribution, but it could be that it is an out of the distribution observation. And the idea is that you want to give a much lower weight to these observations. Taking this into reality actually involves different iteratively interactive procedures. And um, yeah, we have some contributions on this for the linear system. Also, we have a more uh, different perspective using variational approaches for correlated measurements. But the, the, the most relevant idea we want to, I want to bring in is that actually realizing this type of estimators for robust filtering on nonlinear functions over manifold spaces lead to actually very complicated um, estimated procedures. Typically, this leads to cascaded procedures and reformulation of the conventional filters into information filters. And this is the thing, the devil is on the details. Um, so if you ever want to implement this for your own case, of course, feel free to, to write me or check the different literature that exists, because it is actually quite tricky. Now, if we want to basically realize or take a look at how good this uh, behaves, we have a basic Monte Carlo simulation. So we assume that we have a vehicle with four antennas and there's also a base station. And whenever we have multiple antennas and a base station, we know that in principle, we should be able to get precise positioning and attitude. Um, we have different estimators. So we have there's ideal iterative uh, Kaman filter. And this is the one in which all the, allow, all the outliers are known, or better said, the complete noise, noise statistics are known. So this is the, um, how to say, the, the optimal estimator. Then we have the same, but it's one estimator that doesn't know that there are outliers. And this is the one that will most likely fail and be biased due to the presence of the outliers. And then we are checking these different robust statistical based filters. And I didn't mention it before, but of course there are different type of weighting functions or way to deal with the outliers. And one of them, Taki, it's very aggressive. So if you detect that there is an outlier, you could try to completely nullify uh, its influence on the estimation. And Hoover function, it's a bit more soft. So even if you detect that there is an outlier, you do not want to completely eliminate it since this could potentially lead to um, leading to a problem in which you are disregarding all your observations and at the end the system becomes unsolvable. And we have, let's say, all of these different numbers of, of um, satellites and we are inducing so we have 10 satellites and we are inducing outliers in these two. And what we're going to look at is how does the uh, root mean square rule evolves over time and how, what's the likelihood for us to actually properly estimate the integer ambiguities. So this is a, a bit tricky, but what we see, this is on the, on the um, X label, we have the time evolution. And then on the, on the, uh, y axis, we have the different root mean squares for the attitude, for the position, for the by, for the 
bias of the general. I think it's uh, easier if we focus on the position. What we see for the black line is that, of course, the, the ideal filter, which full knowledge on the noise statistics, uh, is not affected by the presence of this. But conventional filters, and this is what we have in every receiver, this is what we typically always use, these get very strongly biased by only having two, let's say, faulty oscillations. The faulty oscillations appear always in this, this type of gray areas, while the white areas are back to the nominal cases. What we showcase is that with this type of um, robust filters that we derived, we are able to gain some protection against the outliers. Although, once again, we have some erratic behavior with this type of um, redescending functions. And these redescending functions is when you completely eliminate um, a faulty oscillation. We also see when we look at the at the end empirical uh, cumulative distribution function that, of course, um, so this is the ideal. Uh, this one on blue, it's the one that we know it will fail. So we have a very large uh, root mean square improvement. And then if we look at what is the likelihood for us to properly fix the ambiguities, um, we see that uh, not only during the time in which the outliers are present, um, we can at least estimate most of them, but also right after the ambiguity, right after the time in which there are layers, we have these very quick recoveries. Ah, now I can breathe. And we can go to the next topic. And this can be also uh, very interesting. And this is constraint filtering. And this is when we earn protection against unknown parameters. And we will see what is unknown parameters or with this, this type of parameters in, for which we have certain assumptions. So if we consider a very general discrete uh, state space model in which there are this type of dynamical and observation function, it is quite common that you have certain parameters in this type, in this time, um, omega and my Greek today, it's uh, terrible. <laughs> and, and this guy. <laughs> um, and the idea is that Typically, you do not, or it could be that you do not know uh, these values in reality. And we assume them as, as if they were typically perfectly known. These, uh, these different um, parameters appear in very various scenarios. For example, we have this type of three wheel model. So when you have a robot with three uh, wheels, um, the way that this robot moves depends on the distance between the back and the front antennas. Also, we have when we have a stereo camera uh, perception, the distance between the two cameras is the baseline. Typically, this is assumed known, but it could be the case that actually there is a small uh, mismatch on them. And also, if you have a system like the one that I was showcasing before, in which you have for a vehicle multiple antennas, and maybe you have an IMU, and you are measuring the distance between the different antennas and the distance of the IMU, and this is what we call level arms, it is actually quite tricky to measure this perfectly. Um, so when we have a mismatch system, what, we, what it, uh, happens is that these different values are not known, but they are just approximate. And the, the, the fact that these are present leads to very large estimation uh, errors. So what do we do? The, the first thing to say is like, okay, we want to try to characterize what is the error due to this mismatch. And this is of course the difference between the true parameter, which is unknown, and what we believe the parameter to be. Of course, this delta error or the, the mismatch is once again unknown. So we could say, okay, if you do not know it, you can estimate it. So you can include it as part of your state estimate. But this might be not the best, because on the one hand, we want to man maintain a low state dimensionality. Also, of course, we do not have any idea of what's a prior distribution of this. And if this changes over time, we have no idea on how is this changing over time. 
So we do not have this perfect time evolution. We do not have the prior distribution. So at the end, we always work with a suboptimal estimator. What to do instead? And this is once again where uh, French people, you always come up with great ideas. And this is the case for linearly constrained filtering. And this was a paradigm that somehow uh, was born out of the mind of Eric Chomet, uh, Jody Villavals. Um, they are from Isaiah Pyro. I think some of them you know already, if not all of them. And now what we want to use is how can we apply linearly constrained filtering to the case in which we have manifold spaces. And also, how does linearly constrained work? So you could say that if you have your observation and you have an estimation model, um, this estimation model depends on your mismatch parameter, then you have or you have the error, which is due to this mismatch. And you can try to linearize it or you try to, to find how does the error changes with changes on the, um, let's say, on, on the mismatch. So at the end, what we have is the contribution of, of a mismatch due to this um, difference vector. And the driving idea is that what we want is to re-derive the Kalman filter. Um, so what is this? Typically, Kalman filter or a Kalman game was designed in a way that you have to want you want to have the minimum variance for an estimator. So at the end, you want to minimize the square errors. And if you had just this, then you are basically estimating the Kalman gain. And this is what we are using all the time in filtering, especially in navigation. Now we say, OK, we want to still minimize the, 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 the mean square error. But we also want to have certain, let's say, uh, constraints. And this constraint is that you want to have um, the contribution of the unknown of the mismatch wanted to be zero. And this is quite practical because you do not know whether your um, system parameters is faulty or not. But you can say if it was faulty, how how is this uh, contributing to the errors? And then you try to minimize that. So in practice, actually, this is quite easy to derive. Um, you need to do the, 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 the effort once. So you need to actually derive what is the contribution of your mismatch into your system. And this might be tricky, but at the end, with some basic algebra and some hand derivation, this is always possible. And the most attractive thing about this linearly constrained filtering perspective is that its actual implementation looks exactly like the one on the Kanban filter, in which we are substituting a conventional Kanban gain with this, what we call L gain, so for the linearly constrained gain. Now, back to the question, how do we use this for manifold problems? So once again, we you might think of this joint position and attitude problem, or simply the navigation problem, where we have what I mentioned before, this combination of real values, the unit 3D sphere, uh, the, the ambiguities, which are integers, and some other biases. So the, a filtering update state at the end it's an optimization problem, or a maximum a posteriori problem, where this looks the same, but now it has this presence of the composition operator that I was mentioning before. The same way, at the end, when we are finding the difference between the observations, the observation model, and we have some Kalman gain, all of these goes to an Euclidean number. And, but of course, we are able to mix it up with our, um, with our state, which is in a manifold space. And this is always possible with the composition operator. As I mentioned before, it is very, very easy to do exactly the same, exactly the same. Of course, the, 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 the devil's on the details, uh, but that's why I'm also writing here the reference to the paper in which we derived this for the first time. And then we are able to constrain, so to have minimum variance estimators 
or as good as it can get um, whenever we also minimize the impact of um, mismatch parameters on the system. And this is valid also to work on manifolds now. Going into how does this look like, once again, from a Monte Carlo characterization point of view, uh, there are also some different real results. I, I did not include them in this presentation just for the sake of brevity. So we want to assess at the end what's the sensitivity of a navigation problem when we have antenna baseline mismatch. What does it mean? I think that we have, let's say, a, a car and we have four antennas. Um, what we want to see is, OK, what happens if we are, if there is one meter distance between the antennas, but we only measure 95 centimeters? Or maybe we are really measuring something much worse, 80 centimeters, 50 centimeters. So this is this percentage of baseline length. It's what we have as a mismatch. And what we consider it's a medium, something similar like before. We have a medium-sized vehicle with four antennas with five meters of separation. So actually, medium-sized vehicle doesn't include a car because you cannot have five meters separation. And once again, we are replicating this type of uh, Monte Carlo simulation, where, of course, the issue is that the separation between antennas that we believe we have doesn't correspond to the true one. So what we see here, and uh, we have the positioning performance, the attitude performance, and the capability of us to find the, the correct um, ambiguities. And we have the blue lines, and we have the yellow, the, the orange lines. The blue lines um, showcase that whenever we have a float solution, at the end, the position is, of course, will never be affected uh, by the baselines because you are just estimating the position of the antenna. But the attitude, of course, is heavily influenced because if you believe that your antennas are like this, but actually they are like that, at the end, you are introducing very large uh, attitude errors. And when, of course, whenever this is the case, there is no chance that you are able to find the correct integer ambiguities. However, when applying linearly constrained, at least for this case of 5% of mismatch, we can actually live with that. So once again, the position is never affected. We can actually get, we can get to this high precision orientation estimation, and we are able to estimate also the uh, integer ambiguous. Upon increasing the mismatch to a 20%, and, and you really need to believe that 20%, it, it's a lot. So typically, you, you wouldn't be uh, failing that much. Um, what we see is that, of course, it takes so much longer time to actually get to um, estimating all of the ambiguities, all of the integer ambiguities correctly. But the attitude performance actually is, is quite well. So we are always able to get this type of high precision solutions. And as before, the, the, the positioning is not affected by that. So wrapping it up, uh, what we can say is that linearly constrained filtering can be successfully applied to manifold spaces, that, that is for sure. Um, the performance, of course, it's conditional on different things. Uh, it is conditional on, on how is, let's say, this, uh, when we are estimating what is the dependence between the observation model and this parameter, the more linear th that it is, the more challenging it is to apply linearly constrained solutions. Uh, it also depends on what's the dimension of the missing specification. But this is not relevant when we are actually deriving the filter. And what we have showcased, at least for the case of um, multi-antenna satellite-based navigation, is that we can correctly fix ambiguities, even with an absurdly large baseline mismatch. OK. And more or less with this, I'm just going to draw some conclusions. So as a small recap, um, I think that if I'm not uh, wrong, maybe satellite-based navigation is not your topic, but this is actually a really interesting topic. It is 
quite rich in challenges, which maybe it's not what you want to have, but it has an enormous relevance in our society. It is impossible that it has become such a fundamental thing for timing purposes, for positioning purposes across very different uh, applications. So if you have some budget and you want to allocate a new PhD with a new topic and you are looking for new challenges, I would highly recommend that you join us in the Genesis, Genesis community. Um, we can also say that robust filtering this has been there forever. And even though it has been there forever, it's still a fantastic tool. It really works even with this type of very complex uh, manifold and integer spaces. And there is this is a work in progress. Robust filtering uh, somehow has been deployed in many different ways uh, and in very different forms. And still, there's a lot of science to, to do that, to, to keep on improving. And we have also showcased the, the, the use of the performance of linearly constrained manifolds and for the particular case of, of navigation. There's some promising perspective on robust statistics and its combination with linear constraint, of course. I leave you here with some relevant publications, but what it is maybe more relevant is about the research perspectives. And this is something that we are already in conversation with Florian, even though the topic has been more or less led for a while now. Uh, but it is very important to have some estimation bounds for the attitude mix model. The attitude mix model is exactly what I described before, whenever you have real vectors, integer vectors, and manifold nodes. You are well aware that Kramer uh provides um, tight lower bounds for real parameters. Um, there are some other bounds that at the end lead to Kramer bound for the integer ones. Um, together with Supairo, we provided the mixed model for real and integers. But so far, we are unable to, at least with Genesis-based solutions, to characterize what is the best that we can estimate the orientation. And therefore, we cannot know what is the best possible estimator for this type of problem. Of course, it will be very relevant. And this is another really big open space. And it re relates to deriving Bayesian bounds for bus filters. Uh, this is across different similar processing topics, but if you, in your research, are able to provide something like that, this could have a great influence in, in our research community, at least for the signal processing. And it is also interesting whenever we want to have some covariance reconstructions and there are no new statistics for not only robust estimators, but also conventional estimators. But this is, of course, for you, a well-known problem. And with this being said, um, this is all from my side. Thank you very much for, for coming here today. Uh...